Hi, you've joined us on Good Friday. My name's Justin Moffat. Uh, Christ died on the cross to save us, and he's given us faith, hope, and love. And it's a faith, hope, and a love that is needed now more than ever. What you're experiencing is an ancient uh, a Book of Common Prayer, 1662, uh, it's the way we've done morning prayer at every Good Friday at St. Philip's Churchill, and we invite all our congregations to join us in these profound words. Some of the words will be very new to many of us. Uh, there are these and thys. Uh, I'm wearing a collar, and so is Bishop Robert Forsyth, who will speak in a few moments' time. You'll notice that the language is, is gender-exclusive, which reflects, of course, the language of the time. We'll invite you, as always, to say the words in bold. Ask us any questions, of course, afterwards, but what you're about to experience is, in many ways, for hundreds of years, been the bedrock of Anglican and even evangelical Anglican belief. And so, perhaps, on this sobering day, it's the best words that we can use to remember Christ's profound and amazing death. The prophet Isaiah said 700 years before Jesus was crucified, he said of a servant unnamed, he wrote, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's, with joy... Uh, sing this profound opening hymn together on page three.
Dearly beloved, the Scriptures moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by His infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble, even at a distance, when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to set forth His most worthy praise, to hear His most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as for the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and a humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me and together this prayer of confession on page four. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Saviour, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins, he pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that the, at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen might like to join me in this prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You might like to respond with the words in bold. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And we can praise the Lord now from our hearts, not just with our lips, by saying together, in this ancient form, Psalm 95. In particular, in Psalm 95, it has those words, Today, if you hear his voice, which will prepare our hearts 
to hear from the readings in a moment's time. Together. O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His and He made it and His hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is the Lord our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here beginneth the 53rd chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here endeth the first lesson. Here beginneth the 20th verse of the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so, you who are going to destroy the temple and build in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the laws mocked them among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this 
Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing by heard this, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Here endeth the second lesson. Psalm 95 speaks about us being sheep of his pasture, willing to hear his voice, and we've heard his voice by those two readings. Psalm 100 asks us to respond to those readings. Psalm 100 also talks, us, talks about us being sheep in his pasture. Let's respond to those readings by saying these words together on page 9. O be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. O go your way into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let's together say the words of the ancient and unifying Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, say with me the words in bold. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Some prayers for Good Friday. Almighty God, we beseech Thee graciously to behold this Thy family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men and to suffer death upon the cross, who now liveth and reigneth with Thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end, together. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole 
body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before thee for all estates of men in thy holy church, that every member of the same in his vocation and ministry may truly and godly serve thee through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a set prayer for peace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And in particular, Father, we pray for ourselves, our nation and our world facing this coronavirus. Keep us safe from this evil. Give to leaders wisdom as they make decisions and to those involved in uh, medicine and in science, patience and care as they seek a path for all of us pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And lastly, a prayer for grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And for those who go to uh, St Philip's and the Garrison Church, you'll recognise this prayer, a prayer of uh, thanksgiving, but it's the ancient version. Why don't you pray it with me? It uses the word humble and hearty thanks. Let's do that together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. This whole service and what Rob said a moment ago is designed that we might survey, to look at the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. I take it that my richest gain, however rich, I count but lost and pour contempt on all my pride. I dare you to stand. Of course, remain seated if uh, that's more comfortable, but I dare you to join with me in this very singable and important hymn.
My name is Rob Forsyth. I'm one of the assistant ministers here at Churchill Anglican. I have, amongst other things, the special responsibility for the 8.30 service and congregation. It's a privilege to speak to you today. Let us pray. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen. Unprecedented. That is the word we've been hearing these last two months. Why, even last week, the Prime Minister himself sent me an email. Dear Robert, it said, we are living in unprecedented times. True. Since the end of January, so much has changed. Our take-it-for-granted assumptions about the ongoing of our daily lives, working at our jobs, the kids at school, the safety of our restaurants, beaches and cinemas, coming to church. All, for the present at least, overthrown. All we can say is that this is all, from our experience at least, unprecedented. Today is Good Friday. If there ever is a day in the church calendar on which we can say this is unprecedented, this is the day. Why? Good Friday is the day we commemorate the death of Jesus. A day when we again proclaim the deep mystery. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Today we commemorate the death of Jesus by crucifixion. But do we know what we're talking about? I mean, today, crosses, we're used to them. You might be wearing a cross even as I speak. We see crosses on memorials and churches. We don't really understand what the cross was in the New Testament days, the days of the Roman Empire. Listen to what Tom Holland a widely published ancient historian and writer, says about crucifixion in his recent book, Dominion, quote, no death was more excruciating, more contemptible than crucifixion. Crucifixions were both common and public in those days. And yet, surprisingly, we have hardly any written descriptions of crucifixions at all. I quote Tom Holland again, and this piece is in the front of the order of service. Despite the ubiquity of crucifixion across the Roman world, few cared to think much about it. Some deaths were so vile, so squalid, that it was best to draw a veil across them entirely. The surprise then is less that we have so few detailed descriptions in the ancient literature of what a crucifixion might actually involve than that we should have any at all. Nevertheless, amid the general silence, there is one major exception which proves the rule. Four detailed accounts of the process by which a man might be sentenced to the cross and then suffer his punishment have survived from antiquity. Remarkably, they all describe the same execution, end of quote. Today we've heard from one of those four surviving accounts, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, and verse 20 and following. For that same execution that those four detailed surviving accounts describe is the execution of Jesus of Nazareth. As you heard, what Mark gives us is stark and unadorned. He is restrained in his description and resists any attempt to explain to the reader what it all means. It is in the letters of the New Testament that something of the profound significance of this day is further unpacked. Mark's description is one of the apparent powerlessness and hopelessness of the scene, although there are hints that something deeper is going on. Our reading picked up at verse 20 of chapter 15. And they led him out 
to crucify him. Mark tells the terrible journey which Jesus makes to the place outside the walls of Jerusalem for public crucifixion, called by the grim name Golgotha, which means, we're told, place of the skull. Usually condemned victim could carry the crossbar to their own execution. For some reason, Jesus is unable to, perhaps because he's beaten, been beaten so terribly, he can't. And then verse 24, and they crucified him. As in most public crucifixions, the detail of the crime that led to this terrible fate of the victim is affixed to the cross as a lesson to others. In Jesus' case, it says, the King of the Jews. That is, here is someone who has set himself up in opposition to the order of Rome and is now being publicly crushed by the power of the empire. The main theme of Mark's account is the contempt that others have for Jesus in his helplessness. Jesus was well known as a miracle worker, as a prophet, and as much more than a prophet. But look at him now. And so they turn Jesus' claims on himself. Verse 29, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. It's the chief priests and elders who notice the cruel irony of the contrast between Jesus' acts of power when he healed people and him now. Verse 31, in the same way the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him, saying among themselves, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. And even sadder, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Jesus proclaimed that the reign of God was near, present in his own life and action. Healings and miracles and all that teaching. But now, there is a terrible darkness from noon to about 3 p.m. Does God himself desert him? Verse 34, at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sapahani, which was Aramaic, but Mark tells us, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, he appears to be speaking the opening words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? There's a lot of Psalm 22 beneath the surface here. But given that the whole of Jesus' ministry was founded on the claim that the reign of God was near and present in his life and action, this seems, on the surface at least, a terrible cry. That he spoke and acted for the Lord God was essential to everything he said and did. But now... There was a misunderstanding about what he said. Verse 36, when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Elijah, the eighth century BC prophet, had been taken up to heaven in the chariot of fire. They think Jesus is calling out for him to come down and rescue him. But nothing. Verse 20, 37, then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. 
Two strange events occur at this moment. Verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And verse 39, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely the, this man was the son of God. The temple was that great temple of the Lord, the living God, which dominated Jerusalem. The curtain is what hides the holy place, the holy of holies, where the presence of the Lord dwells from all that is profane. And so you can read the tearing of the temple curtain in two ways. It could be read positively, the way is now open to the presence of the Lord. Or as I suspect, negatively, the temple is now forsaken by the Lord. It is now profane. Whatever it is, it is all because of what has just happened. But what has just happened? Even stranger are the words of the centurion, presumably the officer in charge of the crucifixion detail. He has seen and heard it all, all the mockery, all the humiliation, all the weakness and the desolate end. And yet he says, truly this man was God's son. It's very hard at this distance to know what he meant and why he should say such an extraordinary thing. The NIV has the word son in capitals, but it could equally be small type, son. But it, as it things turn out, nonetheless, the centurion is certainly onto something. Let me give just two reasons. First, there was a critical moment in the garden the, the night before all this, when Jesus is in agonizing prayer with God, praying about this very thing. I go to Mark 14, verse 34, quote, Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. A cup of bitter suffering. And Jesus recoils from it. But that's not his final word. Yet not what I will but what you will. What you will? What God the Father wills? Jesus goes to this day in obedience, which means, for example, that that cry, which Jesus, those terrible words from the cross, the words of abandonment, Elohi, Elohi, Lema, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is also the moment of the closest trust and obedience to his father. I've always been moved by the insight into this by Scottish theologian Peter Taylor Forsyth, no relation. When he wrote, for, he wrote about the cross and I quote, the great mass of Christ's work was like a stable iceberg, it was hidden. It was his dealing with God, not man. The great thing was done with God. It was independent of our knowledge of it. The greatest thing ever done in the world was done out of sight. The most ever done for us was done behind our backs. Only it was we who turned our backs. Doing this for us was the first condition of doing anything with us, end of quote. Indeed, the high priest mocking was more true than anyone could really have known. He saved others, but no, because he cannot save himself. And second, there's another reason, a profound reason, why the centurion was onto something with his starting declaration, surely this man was God's son. It concerns what happened next. A member of the Jewish council, Joseph Arimathea, gets permission from the obviously ill at ease Roman governor Pilate to take the body of Jesus and instead of the normal practice of throwing the crucified dead into unmarked graves, he places the corpse in a new rock tomb in a garden and seals it. 
Back then, they had a system of double burial. Firstly, the body was tightly wrapped up, then laid on a bench or niche in a tomb. That's the primary burial. A year later, after the flesh had decayed, there was a secondary burial of the bones in a limestone chest called an ossuary. That is what would have happened with Jesus. That's what everybody expected to happen with Jesus. Tune in this Sunday to hear what actually happened. It is unprecedented. Here might I stay and sing no story so divine. That's what Good Friday is about. But it leans forward, as Rob said a moment ago, to the next part of the story, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is our hope. You'll notice on page 14, don't forget, read your Bible every day with the year with Jesus. If you need help or you can give help, make sure you contact us by that uh, community care form. And, of course, uh, during Good Friday... Uh, it being a traditional service, we'd normally pass around a bag, and I'm sure some of you are learning how to give online. Of course, some of you are in need right now, and we'd love you to get in touch with us if you've lost your job or lost some income or opportunities. We'd love to pray with you uh, because we understand what's going on during this season. 
But I guess that's probably why the best way to end is by saying together are the words of the grace from uh, this uh, book of 2 Corinthians. Let's say it together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.